Shalom and welcome to TJC2 Columbus, Ohio and the Ohio Prayer and Worship Network in Columbus, Ohio. Pastor Priscilla Wan and Travis Ziegler are the uh, leaders there. We welcome you to our gathering today with Henry Louis Goulet from the Messianic Studies Institute. We want to welcome our Zoom viewers as well as our Facebook Live viewers. And we want to start with opening with a word of prayer. Avina Malkino, our Father and King, we exalt your name above every principality and power and dominion. We declare that you alone are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We thank you for this opportunity together. And we praise and thank you for Henry Goulet. May you be with him today as he leads us in study of your word for growth. We'd like to introduce you to uh, Henry Goulet. Those of you who may not know him, Henry is the academic dean and executive director of the Masonic Studies Institute here in Columbus, Ohio, Beth Messiah Congregation, where Rabbi Howard Silverman is the congregational leader. Henry's primary interests include the biblical languages, specializing in biblical Greek, the reciprocal relationship between the Tanakh and the New Covenant Scriptures, the study of New Covenant Scriptures from the within Judaism perspective, the way of the Lord as biblical worldview and way of life, the origin, meaning, and instantiation of Ecclesiae, the Jewish Greco Roman milieu of the New Covenant Scriptures, Second Temple. Jewish literature, especially the Pseudofibrica, the full good news. The kingship, kingdom of God, the letters of Shaul, Paul, ancient rhetoric, hermeneutics, paradigms, and conceptual metaphor. He is a member of the SBL and the SPOSTST and has served as an adjunct instructor of biblical Greek and or New Testament at the seminaries of Ashland and Capital University. Henry currently serves as the academic dean and di executive director of MSI, as well as the education coordinator of Beth Messiah Congregation. We welcome you, Henry Louis Goulet with us today. Well, thanks for being here for a lunch and learn. And I'm sorry that introduction was so long. That requires about a three hour explanation right there. Um, let me ask one technical question. And that is, is someone else recording or I am recording? It's already recording right now. So I don't have to turn on recording. Can I shut off recording on my end? Um, I wouldn't do that. I would just let it stay as is. Double record? Yes. Okay, no worries. All right, so I welcome you all and I have a lovely slide deck for us today. It'll take just a minute to set this up. And can you all see that? Yes. Thank you. So there should be a slight delay and you should see a beautiful fractal graphic and you should see the title women, male and female, ethnicity and oneness. What? Because I assumed when people saw this combination of topics, they would think, what in the world is this? So again, I've sent this presentation in color as a PDF to Janice who can put it in the chat and share it with you all or you she can put my email address at mjsi.org in the chat and you can email me and I'll send you the slide deck either way. So here's our outline for this afternoon or this late morning. <clears throat> Maybe we should call this a brunch. And it's a very unique look at all of the following from a deep messianic Jewish perspective, number one giving women of the Bible their due respect and wait till you see where we go with that. Number two, dispelling the historical myth of the inferiority of women. 
Number three, God's asymmetrical gift of man and woman. And uh, you'll find out that it's called the perfect asymmetrical gift. And number four is a holistic view of God's gift of ethnicity. And you'll see why we're tying in ethnicity to this topic. And then exemplary women of the Bible. We're just going to look at two very, very quickly. And then correcting the historical denigration of Mary Magdalene, who's really, really Miriam of Migdal. And then just a word about responding to 21st century ideas about men and women. So fairly holistic, but concise, and hopefully uh, rich enough that we all gain something uh, wonderful from it. As far as resources go, we of course, our primary resource is the scripture, is the Bible. Um, I happen to use this graphic in many a course, many a presentation, but today I blew it up very, very large to see what page of the scriptures this little boy is on and it happens to be the page of Isaiah 52 and 53. So I was all the more delighted that I picked this graphic some years ago from a distance blurry. It looks like it says Psalms, but it's Isaiah 52 and three. And then secondary resources, resources about the topic, not the direct texts we're dealing with. I'm recommending three. Number one is Paul, Women and Wives by Craig S. Keener. You'll find there's very little that he doesn't address in here, including you know, what is considered, at least in the US, as a controversial topic, women in ministry. But I think we just need to go back to Devorah in history, you know, commonly called Deborah, to, to show women in ministry. So uh, we have to think about if men are the ones that gave us the problem of an understanding of women in ministry. And then there's a book in the middle, Gospel Women, Studies of the Named Women in the Gospels, very rich, and engages many perspectives, published in 2002. And finally, a much harder work, but mu very much worth our time. And this is Bruce Winter's Roman Wives, Roman Widows, The Appearance of New Women, and the Pauline Communities. And I would basically say that between the first and third books, there is not one question about what Paul had to say about women, like being silent in the ecclesia, for example, mm. that is not addressed in a very holistic, healthy way with a good exegetical outcome. The one by Bruce Winter is full of Latin, but you'll find out just how contextual Paul's writings are, writing specific letters to address specific problems in specific areas of the world related to the interactions between women and men. And you'll find that it takes and resolves the so-called misogynistic Paul. He's not misogynistic at all. He regularly has women join him in all kinds of ministry. So you should uh, really um, enjoy these works. And then the approach, the approach of this presentation, um, it is beyond conservative versus liberal polarizations and reductions. It is beyond complementarian versus egalitarian polarizations and reductions. I'm not even gonna take the time to define these terms because we can all look them up. But I am gonna say that the extreme conservative position would reduce women to inferior or a shadow of a man. Mm. And the extreme uh, egalitarian position would erase the differences between men and women and allow for them to melt together as if God didn't make a distinction or there was no reason for the two. So that's all I'll say here. Um, this is something new I wanna tell us all about. It's gonna be in a host of courses and presentations at MSI from now on. This book was published in 1998. 
It does specifically have to do with the United States, but it's a lesson for the world and a negative one at that. In the US, over time, we've moved to a pervasive, combative, default, two opposing sides argument culture where no matter what we wanna talk about, someone thinks there's just two sides and the other side is wrong and you're right. And this is how everything is now approached. And I said combative, like warlike. And what I need us to know is that most things in the world and most people are much more complex than two sides, whatever, do justice to. And so we need to be very careful that we who profess to know God, to love God, and to know Messiah, and to follow Messiah, and to love Messiah, and to be in the Spirit, and dare we say we have the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, we better be very careful about falling prey to this pervasive, combative, warlike, default, oppositional argument culture of the United States. And this book by Deborah Tannen is something I'm just reading for the first time. She's a linguist. She identified the problem and suggested the way forward. So we're gonna be way beyond that. Think holistic, wholeness, completeness, soundness, sufficiency, satisfaction, harmony, peace, God's covenant of shalom, which can be defined as all the words I just put up there, that he has with his people, and, and we have as Gentiles in the prince of shalom, who also invited us into the covenant of shalom. Think kingdom and kingship of God and being in the new covenant and new creation, at least the foretaste of the new creation that's mostly in Isaiah 65 and 66, but elsewhere. We're in the new creation. We're a new creation of Messiah. Anyone in Messiah is a new creation. We need to come from this perspective. We need to take this approach. And that's why I take our beautiful graphic and I make a circle out of it. I want us to think 360 degrees, not two sides. I want 360 angles. As whole as God intended, the goal is to allow everything to be or become as whole as God intended. This will require a deeper and fuller 360 degree reading of scripture, as well as the appropriation of like a lost art, wisdom. People always want, you know, hey, can you give me that on a post-it note and two points? No. How about we appropriate wisdom through God's spirit as a portion to us through Messiah Yeshua? How about we do that again? And so this is going to be wisdom in our thinking, our being, our behaving, our doing, and our living. And the foundation of this holistic approach, if you've never engaged Messianic Studies Institute or TJC2, has to do with how God chose to work in history, the big umbrella picture. God chose to work in history by means of Jewish particularism with a universal horizon involving all nations. So God's people, Israel, the Jewish people, on behalf of every nation. So that by, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, we have the consummate number of the Jewish people and alongside them in a numerous host from every tribe, tongue, language group, people group, and nation or ethnicity. That's what God intended. That's how God chose to work. It's never stopped in Yeshua Messiah. And in Revelation 7, you see the ultimate 
outcome of it with the consummate number of Jews next to what I just described. The first key passage to understanding this is Genesis 18, 18 through 19. And we'll do a ton with Genesis 1 and 2 today. What God intended was a worldview and a way of life, not a compartmentalized religion up against other religions in the world. That is a huge mistake of history. You want reading resources on that? I'll recommend them. What God intended was a worldview and a way of life that is referred to in the scriptures as the way of yod heh vav -Hey. That's the, the sacred name of God, Yahweh. The way of the Lord, the way of Yahweh. And it's all about doing righteousness and justice. Righteousness being what is rightly expected in all relationships and situations. And justice, the restoration of righteousness when it's not being had. Key passage we said is Genesis 18, 18 through 19. Avraham is to become a great and powerful nation. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will instruct or command his children and his house or household after him to do what? To keep the way of the Lord, the Derek Adonai in Hebrew, the Derek yod -Heh vav -Heh in Hebrew, the way of Yahweh. How? How do I keep it? By doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised him. I want to encourage you to pull up your questions and save them for a time where I'm going to pause because I'm going to do a long stretch of teaching uh, before I take a break. There are seven topics and I'm going to go through at least three of them in their entirety before we um, break for questions. So if we're going to do this, we have to start with a unit on giving women of the Bible their due respect. And I'll break that down. But a careful reading of the scriptures reveals the typically bold manner in which women of the Bible step up, speak up, take action, and accept daunting risks as keenly observed by Lindsay Hardin Freeman in her 2014 book, Bible Women, All Their Words and Why They Matter. This is really a synthesis of her words about women in the scriptures from a careful read. And I wholly concur with this. So that's why it's on this separate and uh, decidedly beautiful slide. And the paradigm is the Eshet Chayil of Proverbs 31. So this is the word eshet, and this is chayil. And uh, you've heard it translated many ways, and we'll talk about it. The pattern of the eshet chayil, as you read the passage in Proverbs 31, speaks of a woman of valor, trustworthiness, enrichment, daily goodness, resourcefulness, assiduity, assiduity, is diligence and perseverance combined. Strength, energy, hard work, fruitfulness, vigilance regarding the poor and needy. Fearlessness, especially regarding the future at, at which she is able to laugh. Industriousness, even entrepreneurial ship if such a word exists. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She has wise words and instruction of chesed, one of the chief characteristics of God, chesed, his covenant loyal, loving kindness. Watchfulness over the household, indefatigable vigor, vigor that cannot be tired out. And she, as a model, is compared to precious jewels. And she's blessed and praised in the text specifically by her husband and her children, respectively. 
So what is the cry of history then? If this is what the scriptures actually have to say, and we're giving women of the Bible their due, what then is the cry of history? Giving women their due, period, end of story. It means giving women their due dignity, respect, honor, opportunities, wages, etc. Now hear me on this, because in the US, this is where the big warring begins. What does this require? It requires 360 degree thought and action that takes into account five things. The equality of women and men in importance. In some respects, they're not equal at all. So those that just want to make men and women totally equal, like erase the differences between them. That's unbiblical and not according to God's order, God's ordering in the creation of male and female. And we'll show this in the scriptures. But let's talk about their equality and importance. And number two, the differences between women and men as expressed in inherent womanliness and manliness. Inherent meaning by very nature of the creation of God that you are, whether man or woman. Number three, it has to take into account the intended interdependence and mutual blessing of men and women. I don't care what the arena. It could be marriage. It could be a business. It could be an organization. It doesn't matter. There is an interdependence and mutual blessing when men and women co-participate together, given how different they are. The wholeness of what they are together comes to bear on whatever they cooperate in, on whatever they co-participate in. And it can be lacking when there is a lack of that co-participation of male and female, man and woman. It needs to take into account the keen exegetical discernment of what is described or prescribed or culturally constrained in the Bible, which is confused by the general public all the time. Is something Paul commanded a description? Is a text about something describing what is or what was? Or is it prescribing what is or what was? And if prescribed, was it for just then or for all time? We need discernment, discernment, discernment. If wisdom is lacking in the 21st century, discernment is all the more lacking, especially seeing the world has gone in the direction of opinion and don't clutter up my opinion with the facts or the truth. That's where 21st century has gone. As the community Messiah, we cannot support uh, that at all. And number five, uh, being culturally constrained has to do with uh, number four, has to do with, um, is that limited to that culture and the situation that's being dealt with there, or is it for all time? And that we need discernment for. And finally, number five, the new covenant, new creation, equality of women and men as children of God, which is radically new from pre-new covenant times. Women, women gained an equality there uh, that needs to be paid attention to. And so a little sampling from Proverbs 1.8 that already shows that from God's perspective, the wisdom and instruction of a mother is different from a wisdom and instruction of a father, but both are equally important in God's eyes. 
And so Proverbs 1 8 says, Hear my child, your father's instruction, and do not reject your mother's teaching. Or another translation says, Listen, my child, to the instruction from your father, and do not forsake the teaching from your mother. That speaks to God's variegated humanity, the great uniqueness between male and female, and what they bring here to a child. And I'm suggesting they bring that uniqueness to everything. And so when they're coupled, we get something more holistic than when we only get, I'll use it, one side of the so-called equation. And again, when it comes to understanding Paul and all the issues he's addressing with men and women that seem to be, I don't know, making women inferior or telling them to shut up or et cetera, the two books on the left and right, Keener and Winter, uh, address these issues in inordinate detail and satisfactorily answer all our questions. So this is homework and worth it because we'll resolve all of the main issues that have been subject to controversy and debate, uh, particularly in the combative uh, two sides United States of America. So if we're going to give women their due, it starts with dispelling the historical myth of the inferiority of women. This is uh, concise, but pretty in depth. We start with Aristotle, Aristotle, 384 to 322 BCE. Again, as between the sexes, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior. It's explicitly stated in Aristotle, the male ruler and the female subject. And it's been said that philosophical things trickle down to the general public over time and they don't even know it. Well, here's one of them that's still plaguing us in the 21st century. Still from Aristotle, albeit I'm working with Kayla Huber's little paper called Everybody's a Little Bit Sexist a reevaluation of Aristotle's and Plato's philosophies on women that was published. I happen to read this and find this little treatment uh, worthy of inclusion. For the first principle of the movement, whereby that which comes into being is male, is better and more divine than the material whereby it is female. Still Aristotle here. The male, however, comes together and mingles with the female for the work of generation. So Kayla says women are doomed to be subservient to men because they're unable to quote, control themselves, Aristotle, physically and psychologically through the exercise of reason the way men can. So this is not only more explicit inferiority of women from Aristotle, this is stating that women do not have a strong reason the way men can. And then we have Arius Didymus, an Aristotelian and Stoic philosopher, so a product of Aristotle. I want you to see, even in this short sampling, how this gets handed down from generation to generation unhealthily till we still have it here in the 21st century. This is from his Epitome of Stoic Ethics. A man has the rule of this household by nature for the deliberative faculty, the ability to deliberate. In a woman is what? Inferior. In children, it does not yet exist. And in the case of slaves, it is completely absent. Josephus, the self-professed Pharisee and Jewish historian, 37 to 100 CE. So right after the time of Yeshua. Josephus. For says the scripture, a woman is inferior to her husband in all things. When's the last time you read that verse? Hopefully your answer is never. So this is in his Against Apion 2, book 2.24. You can find this in the Sepharia database where all Jewish literature is being compiled. But footnote 23 
in the Sepharia text specifically states that this text, meaning when he says the scripture says this, this text is nowhere in our present copies of the Tanakh. The Tanakh being the Torah, the prophets, and the writings referred to by Christendom as the Old Testament and uh, being corrected to be referred to as the Tanakh so that the Jewish people understand we're referring to the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So we'll never find that because it's surely not in the scriptures. Martin Luther, this is from his table talk quotes in 1533. Girls begin to talk and to stand on their feet sooner than boys because weeds always grow up more quickly than good crops. If this was a course, we of course would pause here, open up a big discussion and say, how do all the, uh, the women here feel today about being referred to as weeds? So again, Julia Hughes Jones, in the preface of her 2009 book, The Secret History of Weeds, What Women Need to Know About Their History, wrote the following. When I first read the above quotation several years ago, I wanted to know why anyone would say such a thing. What I discovered is that Martin Luther's reflection was, and continues to be, the echo of ancient philosophical and theological conjecture about female inferiority. Luther was primed to believe this what? Fallacy by centuries of both great and small minds that came before him. Not much has changed in the years between Luther's observation and the present day, I'm sad to say. So I think it's God's sovereignty that a man at the Messianic Studies Institute would be heralding the Torah, the prophets, and the writings as the starting place for the correction of this view of the inferiority of women. And you'll see all of the kind of literature that I engage written by women about the problem and its potential solution. Then you have Tertullian, which if you're joining us from Africa today, you know he's from Carthage, which is Northern Africa. And so here is a Northern African supposed man of the Ecclesia who gave us ecclesiastical Latin, was an influential shaper of the vocabulary and thought of Western Christendom, who still manifest this problem in huge ways. This is from his On the Apparel of Woman. On the Apparel of Women, book one, chapter one. This is the introduction. Modesty and apparel becoming to women in memory of the introduction of sin into the world through a woman. Does that even sound biblical? Is that Paul's argument that through one woman, sin entered the world? Isn't that interesting that Paul, the one who's accused of being misogynistic, a woman hater, did not say through one man, I'm, I'm sorry, through one woman, sin entered the world. No, he said through one man. He put the blame on Adam. Look at who Tertullian puts the blame on. So these slides have a lot of text, but it's uh, worth seeing. If there dwelt upon earth a faith as great as is the reward of faith, which is expected in the heavens, and it's an old English translation, I apologize. No one of you at all, best beloved sisters, from the time that she had first, quote, quote, known the Lord and learned the truth concerning her own, that is woman's condition, would have desired too gladsome, not to say too ostentatious, a style of dress so as not rather to go about in humble garb and rather to affect meanness of appearance, walking about as Eve mourning and repentant in order that by every garb of penitence, meaning every garment of repentance, 
she might the more fully expiate that which she derives from Eve. The ignominy, I mean of the first sin and the odium attached to her as the cause of human perdition. In pains and anxieties, do you bear children, woman? And toward your husband is your inclination and he lords it over you. Remember, this is Tertullian. And do you not know that you are each an Eve? How do you feel, ladies, about being called an Eve by Tertullian? The sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age. The guilt must of necessity live too. He doesn't quit here. You are the devil's gateway. This is ecclesial history. This is the Tanakh as exegeted through the New Covenant scriptures. This is what Yeshua had in mind. This is what God had in mind. Yeah, we have a saying in the United States, no way, Jose. Imagine being called the devil's gateway. And just want to remind everybody, please mute yourselves if you're not muted. Thank you. You are the unsealer of that forbidden tree. You are the first deserter of the divine law. You are she who persuaded him whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. Imagine this claim. You destroyed so easily God's image, man, on account of your desert, that is death. Even the son of God had to die. And you think, and do you think about adorning yourself over and above your tunics of skins? Come now, if from the beginning of the world, the Milesians sheared sheep and the Syrians spun trees and the Tyrians died and the Phrygians embroidered with the needle and the Babylonians with the loom and the pearls gleam and onyx stones flashed, if gold itself also had already issued with the cupidity which, which accompanies it, from the ground, if the mirror too already had license to lie so largely, Eve, expelled from paradise, Eve, already dead, would have also coveted these things. I imagine, yes, Tertullian, you do imagine. No more then ought she now to crave or be acquainted with if she desires to live again, what when she was living, she had neither had nor known. Accordingly, these things are all the baggage of woman in her condemned and dead state, instituted as if to swell the pomp of her funeral. I can only think of one word for this, over the top and disgusting. Well, I'm going to travel to the 1960s, and I'm going to tell you to see No Limits, The Life of Katherine Johnson, extras number one in the 2016 DVD version of the movie Hidden Figures regarding the perceived inferiority of women intellectually and otherwise and how computing numbers was viewed by male engineers at the time as work that was beneath them. So that's the 60s. And as I kind of come to the near end of this part of the topic, I want you to see Half the Sky, Nicholas D. Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun. Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide. Published by Knopf in 2009, by Vintage in 2010. It's also available as a DVD, which I have. These authors hold that the paramount moral challenge of the 21st century is the global brutality against women and girls. The issues include everything from perceived inferiority our starting place for correction, to suppression, to economic oppression, 
you can put oppression under suppression. But economic oppression to rape, to sex trafficking, to female genital mutilation, and beyond. This book is considered essential reading for every global citizen. And you should compare the 2030 Sustainable Developmental Goals of the UN, number five of which specifically addresses the issue of ending this mistreatment, understanding of women as inferior, and holding back what is due to them across the board. Which brings us to number three. <clears throat> and like I said, start the questions. This is, a, this is a lengthy section as well. I want to deal with the solution. God's asymmetrical gift of man and women. Man and woman. Genesis 1. Everything is created, ordered by God according to its kind. There's wondrous variegation in God's perfect creation. I love to tell the story of going to plant land. When you go to plant land and you see all the diversity of plants at the land, no one, no one says, hey, how come they're not just all roses? Why all this diversity? So if that's true at plant land, why then does humanity have a problem with man and woman being part of God's diverse creation? And later, why is there a problem with God's variegated humanity from every tribe, language, people group, nation, ethnicity? Why are there problems with other ethnicities? Why is there an ethnic war in the United States? Why was it allowed for white to be created as a white supremacist construct to make everything else inferior? Why was that allowed in history? Why do Messiah followers buy into that today, still in the 21st century? We'll get there. We'll address that problem as we look what's to gain from understanding male, female, man, woman, husband, wife, a new unity called echad in Hebrew, a new oneness. That new oneness of man and woman does not erase male, female, man, woman, husband, wife. They still remain those distinct two, but the two become one flesh. So at from one angle, they are one. And from another angle, they are distinct, separate, wonderfully different male and female. We can bring that to the ethnic problem uh, in the world and solve it. And especially if we say we're in Yeshua Messiah and we have this problem, I would argue we're devoid of the spirit of God. And I doubt we're in Yeshua Messiah. Maybe we're just in some kind of Christian religion. Anyways, we start here with the overarching, according to its kind, wondrous variegation in God's perfect creation, including humanity. Genesis 1 is characterized by many sevens. And seven was both an ancient Near Eastern, hereafter abbreviated as Annie, number of cosmic order, and later a number of perfection. And if you want to understand seven as a number of perfection, get a hold of Philo of Alexandria's writing on the creation. It is one of the most detailed, profound, explicitly explicated, mean, explained in detail. Um, treatments of the topic of seven. And now we move to 126 through 28 and 31. And we're going to quote from David Gellinter, Judaism as a way of being, because we said that there's a lot to learn from the Jewish heritage and essence of the Messianic worldview and way of life. Uh, Ralph Corner has written a book on the origin and meaning of ecclesia, and argue why it should no longer be translated church, but community, congregation, assembly uh, of Messiah. 
And uh, there we will find that he says, no community of Messiah was ever meant to be separated from its Jewish heritage and essence. So wait till you see what Gelinter has to say here, which is so revelatory from the Torah, the prophets and the writings alone. In Judaism, the two preeminently unlike parts of a perfect whole are naturally male and female human beings, but also maleness and femaleness in general. More surprising is the perfect whole they make. The rabbis are vividly attuned like a painter to the nuances of their pigments to the male and female aspects of everything in the universe. Start with the Bible. It's writing on relations between male and female is a supreme achievement of realism and beauty, but you must be tuned to the biblical frequency or you will miss it. It's actually not till we get to the prophets, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> that the metaphor of husband and wife is used for Israel and God or God and Israel. The parent-child relationship features before that, but in the prophets, it moves to that. And if you're a single woman today or you're a single woman seeing the video, don't feel uh, bad about yourself because while the emphasis is on what happens in the marriage between male and female, we've already said that has implications for men and women collaborating, co-participating, co-partnering in anything because of the wholeness that these two perspectives bring when they're put together. And that's why it was said, by the way, it's not good for the man to be alone. We'll see a specific context for that, but you better, better think about that. It's not good to be alone. Perfect interchangeable symmetry is ordinary next to the mystery and beauty of men and women's perfect asymmetry. The two parts are equal in importance, but not interchangeable. In his work on Genesis 2.18 on page 99, Gellinter rightly takes us to Hosea 2.16 in its context because of what it teaches us about what God intended between Israel and God. Originally and clearly hinted at in the depiction of the intended relationship between man and woman, man and female, in Genesis 1 and 2. In fact, it's right for scholars to think that God gave humanity marriage so that they would understand in a tangible daily relationship what it is like to be in covenant relationship with God as the people Israel. And later we get the inclusion of the nations in Messiah, but we're in covenant relationship as community with God. And marriage teaches us a lot about that and that teaches us a lot about marriage. So it goes back and forth in some kind of reciprocal relationship. Now we move, especially to Genesis 2.18. The premise is it's not good for the Adam, man, to be alone. And yet he had God. The statement immediately follows the commandment of God. After God tells him, you can eat from all the trees except don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right after that commandment, the text says it was not good for man to be alone. I'm tipping my hand to say that some scholars think it's in order to obey God's commandments, God needs the help of a woman. And so the text says, I will make for him, and then you have the yellow and green. The first two words in Hebrew, I will make for him, and that yellow word is azer, and the green word is kenegdo. I will make for him an azer kenegdo. And Everett Fox's Five Books of Moses translation says, I will make a helper, an azer, corresponding to him. And the more you look at it, it looks like the text says, equal but opposite him. You know, and think about equal and opposite, corresponding to him. I mean, they actually fit together physically. That's how complementary they are. That's how much they belong together. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So I want you to see the use of the word azer. She's going to be an azer for the man. I want you to see that the word azer is primarily used of God in what he does for Israel. And I gave you a few passages. God is the azer of Israel. So a woman is an azer to a man as God is an azer to Israel. In our marriage course, we talk about how God at one point rides a chariot across the sky to help his people, Israel. And we joke about when's the last time, ladies, you rode a chariot across the sky to help the man. Um, and, and though, understand that woman is not reduced to this role. But this is what the text originally says. I will make an azer that is equal, opposite, complementary, perfectly suitable to him. In Genesis 2.23, ish and isha are the words from different roots denoting co-affiliates co-participants with one another as man and woman, even later, husband and wife, right? So these two words, ish and isha. The man needing the woman as an azer, like God, to keep the commandments of God. And you, you can see, for example, David uh, Stein's essay, the noun ish, in biblical Hebrew, a term of, a term of affiliation a special affiliation with each other. And this is in the journal of Hebrew scriptures. And I have it, if you want a copy of it, you email me. Stein highlights, get this, the largely ignored work of the late Allison Grant on Ish in the Tanakh. And I have, also have that essay for you. When God uses Isha of Eve, whose name is Chava, in Hebrew, Adam uses ish of himself. Even though he's referred to as the Adam, his name is Adam, but he is the Adam, the man. But when God uses Isha of Eve, Adam uses ish of himself. That tells us something. It seems that Adam knew that he had to become a profound co-affiliate, co-participant, co-partner with his Isha. The word Ish has a wondrous phonetic relationship with Isha and demonstrates just how affiliated and participatory the holistic one flesh relationship between man and women was intended to be by God's design and ordering. Here it is. It says, and the man said, yeah, and the Adam said. It's not the word each there. It's and the Adam said. This one, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called Isha, for she was taken from Ish. That's where Ish is used. Uh, when God, in the previous uh, verses, introduced her as Isha. There are holistic implications here, and I picked this. I search for all my graphics. I picked this puzzle pieces, these puzzle pieces, you know, intentionally. So that you could see one holistic unity with one holistic unity that actually fit together like a man and a woman do. And there are holistic implications here, not just for man and woman, male and female, husband and wife, but for God and Israel and for Jew and Gentiles, one and Messiah. They're supposed to be together. Yes, as one, a new echad, oneness, but not a oneness that erases the distinction of Jews and Gentiles. Paul is misheard and misunderstood on this. We'll take a peek at that. So there are implications there for also Messiah and the Ecclesia, the community of Messiah followers.
the story of Adam and Eve, the biblical text itself versus pop theology and Western art. Is Eve remembered today from Genesis 3.20 as the mother of all living? Is that the standard recollection of Eve that has been handed down to us? Oh, the mother of all living. And what is the very next verse? Genesis 3.21, about. And note the proximity of Adam's naming of Eve mother of all living, to that very next verse, which is all about God's redemptive action on behalf of Adam and Eve. We need to see that she is called by Adam, mother of all living, as like the conclusion of it, right before God provides for the animal skins. That is having a deep look at the passage. And where's the apple in the story? We seem to get our information from art and pop theology. I think the historical mistake has to do with the similarity between the, uh, the Latin um, ma loose, long a, the word for apple, and the Latin malus, short a, word for evil. I thought it was an apple tree. I bring that in just to say a careful reading of Genesis 1 and 2 should lead us to the conclusions that text leads us to. <clears throat> and not what pop theology and Western art tells us. The women in scripture entry on Eve rightly contends that, quote, the image of Eve who never appears in the Tanakh after the opening chapters of Genesis, may be more strongly colored by post-biblical culture than by the biblical narrative itself. For many, Eve represents sin, seduction, and the secondary nature of women. Thus, the writers of the Women in Scripture Dictionary rightly assert that it is necessary to point out some of those views that are not intrinsic to the ancient Hebrew story, but come from somewhere else. Well, a little bit from an observational Bible study of Genesis 1 through 3 in literary perspective by Michelle Lee Barnwall in her book, Neither Complementarian Nor Egalitarian, A Kingdom Corrective to the Evangelical Gender Debate. Um, I'm quoting from the book, but I'm not recommending the book. Um, number one, it's just an evangelical perspective. It's not holistic enough. Number two, she's a supersessionist. She thinks like, you know, God's finished with Israel, forget the Tanakh, and we'll move on with what God is doing only in apparently Jesus and Gentiles is what I'll say, how I'll say it. Uh, but God always continues Jewish particularism with a universal horizon. If she was not trapped in a paradigm of supersessionism, she would see that Acts 2 is not the birth of the church, it's the restoration of Israel. Only Jews are present or proselytes who became Jews. And what you see is that the restoration of Israel gets sufficiently underway so that by Acts 10, the outreach to the nations can begin. It's the same in the accounts of the good news. Um, Jewish followers of Messiah is all the instruction. Only when we get to Matthew 28 do we now have the Jews being told, ah, now go make disciples of all the nations. The average person in Christendom is not aware that it's all about Jewish particularism with a universal horizon involving all the nations. And even the good news is good news to the Jew first and to the nations or the Gentiles. And all of that distinction is important even in the unity. And we can explain the passages that are used to say, no, it all went away. And there, there's some kind of homogenized humanity now. No, there's not. The problem, uh, I think it's Umberto Casuto that said it. The problem is never with the text. It's with our understanding of the text. So here's some points. Observation number one, 
Adam's charge to keep God's command is the central conflict as evidenced by Genesis 2, 16 through 17. One cannot be like God, that is to say, be his image bearers without obedience to his commandment there, commandments later. Where is Eve? According to Genesis 2, when Adam receives this commandment, that's right, not created yet. Let's read Genesis 2.18 in light of 2.16 through 17. Is it any wonder that Azer, see slide 37 for that uh, discussion, I think that's the slide, means what it means and can be illuminated by the manner in which yod heh is an Azer to Israel, a helper to Israel. There it is. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. That's the CSB 17. The NRS says, I will make him a helper as his partner. And the net says, I will make a companion for him who corresponds to him. And the ESB says, I will make a helper fit for him or suitable for him is the next translation, the NAU. We'll just do those five. But look what proceeds. It's not good to be alone. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of a knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you'll certainly die. So scholars are right to say it looks like in order to keep God's commandments, it's not good for the man to be alone. He needs a helper. Woman is that helper. Can't be reduced to that, but that's one of the chief things that women do for men. In order to really live out the way of the Lord, we need both. And if truth be known, the image of God is tied to male and female. He created them. The story structure draws special attention to Adam's reception of, transgression of, and then finally judgment for breaking the command not to eat the tree of a knowledge of good and evil. Where's Adam when Eve is deceived by the serpent? Well, see Genesis 3, 6 for the answer right beside her. Observation number four, in Genesis 2 through 3, the commandment not to eat the tree of a knowledge of good and evil is repeated five times. Isn't that interesting? Five times the command when there's a five-fold Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I find that fascinating. Note that the story uniquely relates the command directly to Adam throughout the passage. First, in Genesis 2.17 is the direct command to Adam. Second and third. In the pivotal scene with the serpent in Genesis 3, 1 through 3 is the mention of the command in two forms, one manipulated by the serpent. The question to Eve in Genesis 3, 13 is more generic. What's this that you have done? What is her answer and who does she blame in Genesis 3, 13? You know, they're both doing this. The serpent made me do it. She made me do it. It's a blame game. It's interesting that the great co-participation, joint heirs of the grace of life falls apart when the sin happens, then it's a blame game. The wholeness <clears throat> intended is damaged. What is her answer? And who does she blame? And what is the consequence for her in Genesis 3.16? The Hebrew word, by the way, for rule over she has the trouble, difficulty with pregnancy, and then this issue with her husband. And so the Hebrew word for rule over is mashal. It's the same word as found in Genesis 4, 7 and 37, 8. And you really need to see that because 4, 7 has to do with sin crouching at the door and you have to master it, rule over it. That's the word being used here. Don't miss the difference. So I think those passages will help you understand what the ruling over uh, is talking about. But don't miss the difference between the holistic relationship that was intended between male and female, man and woman, and the conflictual relationship that resulted from Adam's disobedience that we're stuck with today. Fifth, in Genesis 3.17, God directly related the consequence for Adam's disobedience to the command itself, even though listening to Eve is mentioned. He's ultimately responsible. 
because he was given the command before she was in existence. What is his response? And who does he blame in that passage? 312. The man replied, the Isha that you gave to be with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate the blame game. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your labor pains and with and pain, you will give birth to children and you will want to control your husband, but he will dominate you. Or look at the ESV, you shall desire, uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. Conclusions, yet given the story, what does Adam name his wife, mother of all sin? Mother of all deceit? Mother of all easy deception? No. Mother of all living. Moreover, does Romans 5.14 argue that nevertheless death reigned from Eve until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Eve? Or is it Adam there? Does Romans 5 argue that through one woman's deceit or disobedience, many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous, or is it Adam there? Note the bene means note well. I'm not intentionally avoiding or hiding the statements about even 2 Corinthians 11.3 and 1 Timothy 2.13, but all of Paul's letters are situational letters dealing with specific issues in specific communities of Messiah followers. And what most professed followers of Messiah don't know is that a new women emerged in the Roman Empire at the time Paul was writing his letters that were bold, that were letting go of traditions, that weren't having children <clears throat> because they viewed it as a deformation of their body and who were boldly speaking up in public gatherings. And Paul thought it was hurting the good news because they were being like the new women. And so without that knowledge of what's going on in Paul's days, we read his letters as if it's generic theology for all times. When in fact, he's dealing with very specific issues, which is why he tells them to be preserved through childbirth etc. So that's why I highly recommend you read Keener's book and, and Bruce Winter's book. Bruce deals with these things from the perspective of the Roman Empire in inordinate detail. It's a book dedicated solely to the new women. Keener's book is far more global in what it covers, and both should be read in their entireties. And I deal with the, in a course on this topic at MSI that will be recorded at some later date. We've already done it live. We, we deal with the Pauline passages, the passages from Paul in detail. Another conclusion, as Genesis, when heard on its own terms and from its own inherent perspectives, serves as the introduction to the Torah in particular and the Tanakh in general, Torah, the prophets and the writings in general, have we ever observed how this whole story of Adam and Eve prepares us for Israel? The commandments given to Israel? The testing or temptations they face? Their disobedience? Their resultant exile from the promised land? And God's actions to rescue and restore them? The best scholarship shows that the story of Adam and Eve right there in Genesis is a microcosm that prepares for the story of Israel. Because whoever reads Genesis 1 through 11 has to understand how it serves 12 through 50. If we're reading the Bible without losing its Jewish heritage in essence. Michelle Lean Barnwall's overall conclusions regarding the Adam and Eve story are quite right. The perfect sameness of kind of Adam and Eve is critical to the story. Story Everything was created according to its kind. So God's ordering of the cosmos is there with his creation of male and female. 
So the sameness of kind, even though they are different genders. Their, perf their perfect correspondence to one another as male and female in the words azer kenegdo is critical to the story. We add from Gelenter, their perfect asymmetry is critical to the story. And finally, the goal of their perfect unity as male and female in the words one flesh is critical to the story. The goal of the reality of man and woman, male and female, Adam and Eve, Israel and God, Israel and the nations, Jews and Gentiles, one and Messiah, is a healthy, holistic unity that can be viewed as akin to the very unity God intended between male and female, husband and wife, in a new echad oneness, where from one perspective, the oneness is so important. And from another perspective, the two very different contributors to the oneness are validated in their distinct identities. And we can tie this to a holistic view of God's, you know, a holistic view of God's gift of ethnicity. And we ought to make this connection uh, right away. Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. So God's people, Israel and all the nations of the earth, view that like the male and female side and the new oneness. Jewish particularism with a universal horizon involving all nations is how God has always and ever worked in history, even in Messiah Yeshua to this day. The olive tree metaphor needs to be reinstantiated. Luke 2.31, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. It's like Christendom cannot even see that this verse is there. Notice the distinction. You have prepared in the presence of all peoples. You can go look up the richer context. A light for revelation to the Gentiles on one hand and for glory to your people on the other. Revelation and glory. Glory, gospel, good news to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. So think of the value of seeing man, woman, oneness, Jews, Gentiles, oneness, and not homogenizing anyone. I am a Lord. I called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I'll appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. So again, there's one of Israel's role, but you cannot reduce Israel to a light to the nations. You can't reduce her to that. You have the great passage in Deuteronomy 7 about God setting his love on his people. They're not a utility company for the nations. They're his loved people, first and foremost. I bring my righteousness. It's not far off. I bring it near. My salvation will not delay. I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. He says, Isaiah 49, 6, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Pay attention to me, O people, Isaiah 51, 4. And give ear to me, O nation, for a law will go forth from me, for the Torah will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear on you. That's Israel. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Deuteronomy 32, 43, rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance 
on his adversaries and he will atone for his land and his people. Romans 15, 10 quotes Deuteronomy 32, 43. And again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles or nations with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles and let all the peoples praise him. Why does Paul address Gentiles and Jews if they don't exist anymore? Why does he say it's the good news to the Jew first and to the Greek and to the Gentiles and to the nations if they don't exist anymore? We have obviously misunderstood Paul's uh, negative statements about there is neither Jew nor Greek. That was um, not a case of absolute negation, but relative uh, negation. It's called dialectical negation, so you don't miss the larger truth at the end of the equation. So he quotes that in Romans 15, 10. Isaiah 19, 23. At that time, there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will visit Egypt and the Egyptians will visit Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians, by the way, Egypt's in Africa, right? I'm sorry to say most people in the United States don't know Egypt is in Africa. The continent, the country. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. At that time, Israel will be the third member of the group along with Egypt and Assyria and will be a re recipient of blessing in the earth. Look at this. The Lord who commands armies will pronounce a blessing over the earth, saying, Blessed be my people, Egypt, and the work of my hands, Assyria, and my special possession, Israel. By the time you get to Revelation 7, you have Israel, every tribe, language, people, group, and nation, ethnicity, all together, getting along just fine as intended by God. So if we see a problem with that in the 21st century, there's something wrong with those human beings. And I, I would argue they don't have the spirit of God and they're not in Messiah because you'd actually be a new creation and that would be put back together. There's something wrong with us if we can't achieve that kind of unity and appreciation of God's diverse creation. And we get it right from male, female, echad. Jews, Gentiles, Echad. Ephesians 2.14, for he is our shalom, our peace, the one who made both groups into one who destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility. He destroyed the hostility. Making the two groups into one is just like the marriage. You make the two into a one, but that doesn't erase the individual identities of the two contributors to that unity. So don't miss this connection from man and woman. We need the reinstantiation of the olive tree metaphor because the way we're behaving now doesn't make one Jew jealous. Gentiles are supposed to be making Jews jealous. You should see the first video uh, I did a few months ago for TJC2 where we talked about this in detail and why our terminology even has to change if we're ever going to make, as Gentiles, the Jews jealous again for their own Messiah. And as we wrap this section, this is also poorly understood. And if you email me, I can send you an essay on this by David J. Rudolph. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20. It's Paul's rule in all the congregations. Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them and to which God has called them. What does he mean by leading life assigned to them? Well, we continue. This is my rule in all the communities of Messiah. Was anyone at the time of their call already circumcised? That is to say, Jewish. Let them not become uncircumcised. And Rudolph and others say that we need to see that this means, that is, let them not live as if they had not been circumcised. Being Jewish is a calling. Earlier Israelite, later Jewish, is a calling and a gift and an assignment of God. Was anyone at the time of their call, meaning to Messiah, uncircumcised from, the, from any nation? 
let them not become circumcised. Ah, proselyte and God fear is over. There's a new creation in town. You stay what you are. You specifically stay what you are, Jew is Jew, and whatever nation, ethnicity you are, you stay it so that the whole world can see Jew next to Arab, <clears throat> Egypt next to Assyria, Canadian American Henry next to whatever. We're supposed to see because it's rejoice, O nations, with his people Israel now. We're supposed to show the world how we get along as one in Messiah, just like man, woman, echad, one. Jews, Gentiles of every kind, <clears throat> echad, one. And then he says, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. And that's where the superficial reader, hearer of scripture immediately says, see, no Jews, no Gentiles anymore. No, this is called dialectical negation. It's a, neg it's a negation of something so that you see the greater point. And so what's being negated? Circumcision and uncircumcision. And why? To make the greater point of what matters is that Jews keep the commandments they're supposed to keep and Gentiles keep the commandments they're supposed to keep. The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 specifically highlighted what were the commandments Gentiles were to keep and Jews already know the commandments they're supposed to keep and now we're together in Messiah and we have to get along and mostly Gentiles have to respect Jews for all of their requirements that we don't take on such as kashrut kosher foods that remains in Messiah Jews remain kosher in Messiah and so Gentiles have to respect that and be careful what they bring to eat at their joint meetings. And so we need, so we need that. But Jews are Jews and Gentiles as Gentiles. Jews as Jews, Gentiles as Gentiles, one is Messiah. Let each one remain in that situation in life in which they were called. So that means being Jewish or being African or being a Jewish African, or being a Gentile African, is a gift from God to be celebrated as his diversity. And then it all gets tempered in Messiah, such that anything in anyone's culture in Messiah, anything in anyone's culture in Messiah, has to be repri reprioritized and revalorized in light of what the new covenant requires. Everybody refines, but retains their ethnicity as a gift. And even if I've been very repetitive, it's been by design because this is so lost in history and so lost among at least the community of Messiah followers in the United States where great wars in the US are happening <clears throat> between people groups, which just proves we are devoid of the spirit of God, not in Messiah for real, uh, because many uh, professed Messiah are in these battles and mistreating each other. It ought not to be this way. This is a very bad sign. So 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20 must be known by us, practiced by us. And my recommended reading here, this is the general public book that Brian Tucker wrote uh, to back up his doctoral work, altogether different, upholding the ecclesia's unity while honoring our individual identities, including the fact that you're a man or a woman, or you have an ethnicity. He talks about how your identity, I mean, your ethnicity is re-gifted to you in Messiah. It's gifted back to you in a way that you can get along with any ethnicities. <clears throat> so very, very important reading. And uh, here I'm going to stop my share and finally open it up uh, for questions. I know that was like serving, um, you know, six course lunch uh, before we 
get to even say what's on the plate, but I felt that that had to be done in a single unit. And the rest that we have is, is very short, uh, but still helps us tremendously. Lovely to see you all, by the way. You'll find that those who really love God and understand what we've said today, like Jason Silverman, I'm gonna highlight as an example, understands Jewish promise of the land and also sharing the land with Arabs. So he is a shalom maker and he's a diplomat. He's a diplomat on the way to when the fullness of the kingdom of God comes and it's very clear, everybody's together, one in Messiah. So you're gonna find Jason Silverman to be a great example of a shalom maker and a diplomat until we get there. But I know many in Israel right now who love their Arab neighbors, and don't want any part of this warring. That's very much like man, woman, echad. Uh, blessed are the unassuming, they will inherit the land. That would be a good translation of the passage in Matthew 5. That's usually translated, blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. Meek makes it sound like blessed are the ones who allow themselves to be steamrolled. That's not it. It's blessed are the unassuming. And you can, you can uh, search online for an article called Meekness, M-E-E-K-N-E-S-S, -E -E and, and Sam Meyer, M-E-I-E-R. And you'll find an understanding of meekness that'll blow your mind. Then think, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the land. So we learn that from uh, man and woman. Lynette, I, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say thank you. He, he's <laughs> just that I appreciate what all he's sharing. That's very kind of you. Um, we have a little more that has to do with some exemplary women. You're going to be shocked with who I start with. We're going to deal with Mary Magdalene, which is really Miriam of Migdal. And we're going to clear up the fact that she wasn't a prostitute. And then we'll close out with how we can approach the 21st century. Anybody else? Anyway, I was just going to give everyone a reminder that um, if you are concerned about the notes and the slides, we have placed the link for the um, slide deck in the chat. So you have that. And then secondly, if you do want to contact Henry for something else, or if you, after viewing the slides, you have questions, we also put his email address in the chat. And we'll eventually have a big course up called Women of the Bible. You know, it probably won't be called that because we're going to deal with <clears throat> giving women their due period. So probably have a different title, but we did it as Women of the Bible and, and included all of this in a six week format. So it'd be six you know, six sessions of videos. Henry? Yeah. Hey, greetings. Um, so I was just thinking about Paul. So if he lived in 21st century, uh, and I like what you're saying because I had had the, you know, they always had the question of the first Timothy and uh, first Corinthians passages in, in light of the good balance that I know I, I already was aware of, but this is helping clarify some of the reasoning that, that this is substantiated. Well, you know, I think if Paul lived now, he would probably still be saying specific things to specific congregations in light of the uh, matter at hand and advancing the kingdom. And that would probably be misconstrued in, a, in another 20 to 30 years, or maybe 20 to 30 days. So I think that it's good that we're re, uh, you know, re-engaging with his reasoning so that we could, uh, um, and the misogynistic Paul, which one of those three books was best at, at, at answering that again? I, I wasn't. Well, I do, I do think that you have to read both Keener and Winter. Winter is the harder read, but I can tell you that when I was done with Winter, I immediately contacted him and said, 
I'm telling you, this book was a labor of love. And he said, Henry, you have no idea because I had to really study Latin inside out to be able to look mm -hmm. at all these documents because he provides quotations in English from Latin writings to show what's going on contextually and why Paul is addressing, you know, speaking up in mixed company. Um, why would he say, you know, he doesn't say you're saved through childbearing. He says you're preserved through childbearing. And then you find out women weren't getting pregnant. And Paul's thinking like, this is a disaster because from, from the perspective of God's people, Israel, you know, re replenishing the earth is what it's all about with, with God's people. So you'll find tremendous help. And if you want, you know, just read the sections of the book that deal with that. He lays out all the information, but then go read the sections on Timothy and so forth. Those are chapters and those will be really helpful. Okay, thank you. And if, if you need help, you know who to call. We can help you with that Greek. Anybody else? Anything in the chat that needs responded to, uh, Janice? So far, no. We've pretty much asked answered the questions about the books. There was someone wanted to know the references for the books, so I think we're good. Okay, very good. And you'll have the deck so you can see those books. So I'm going to just uh, bring up the slide deck again and pick up where we left off. And exemplary women of the Bible. So this is very short, and I do it just to make my point. I start with Joshua 6, 17, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. <clears throat> Only Rahav, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. So this, of course, is the story in Joshua about the surveyors who are sent to the land. They're not spies, they're surveyors, all right? No uh, Mission Impossible soundtrack playing in that text. Um, they are surveyors of the land and they need some help and protection. And Rahav, the prostitute, hides them in the roof of her place and lies to the people that try to come after them. And so I, I pick a prostitute as the hero just to shatter our paradigms, our concretized ways of seeing, thinking, hearing, listening, reading, how it was all handed down. They didn't see this. And I'm proud to say that I was coming back from a tour of Israel once, and one of our uh, great thinkers on that tour, himself uh, part archaeologist, part scholar, uh, so can we talk in the airport? And I said, sure. So we we're in Israel at the airport to come home. And he said, it seems like the Tanakh would hold that it's okay to lie to save a life. Yes, that's right. You would say, no, no, the surveyors went that way. And you'd hide them on your roof because you're saving a life. It's the number one principle in the Tanakh to preserve a life. It's later called by the rabbis, pikuach nefesh, preserving life, saving life. It's considered the highest ethic. It's another way of expressing in two words, Leviticus 19.18b, love the one next to you as if they were the same as you. Love your neighbors yourself really means love the one next to you as if they were the same as you. There's no Western self-love in the idea of scripture. There's no, oh, I will love me. Here I am loving me now. I have great self-esteem, and now I'll turn it on others. That's Western um, psychology. That is not the biblical text. Ancient Near Eastern, ancient Hebrew, ancient Israelite, later Jewish, no. It's all about loving the one next to you as if they were the same as you. That's amazing. And so the principles, pikuach nefesh, preserve a, a life. And so she lies to preserve a life, and that that's righteousness. Uh, she's, 
she's later talked about being justified by her actions. So we'll see that. So I'm highlighting Rahav the prostitute. Sometimes the deck is uh, slow to move, I apologize. James 2.25, believe it or not, right? Highlights Rahav. And similarly, was not Rahav the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another way and told her followers they went that away <laughs> to distract them so that they could get away. And she's mentioned again in the list of illustrious ancestors in Hebrews. By faith, Rahav, the prostitute, escaped the destruction of the disobedient because she welcomed the surveyors in peace, in shalom. So let's make sure we understand uh, who exemplary women are in the scriptures. And I suppose I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Miriam, the mother of Yeshua in Luke chapter one. We have to think about the fact that when it came time, you know, the fullness of the time for Yeshua to be birthed as a human being in this world through a woman, you gotta think about the two people that were picked. Go back to our great diagram of man, woman, achad, the oneness. You got Yosef and Miriam, two consummate Jewish people who are so observant. Read the text carefully about every jot and tittle they follow to observe the Torah flawlessly. And look at how Yosef is called, you know, being righteous. It's a participle there. The Greek participle is present continuous. Yosef being a righteous person. That's how the text read, reads. Yosef being a righteous person. Meaning always doing what is rightly expected in relationships and situations. He tries to, to put her away secretly so she cannot be hung out to dry. That's the person that gets coupled with Miriam. Miriam is just such an unbelievable Jewish woman. Torah observant to the nth degree. She must have a robust prayer life and she must know the Psalms inside out. Because her prayer is not like, not unlike another famous woman we know from the scriptures. And she can get a visitation from an angelic being and then graciously accept what's going to happen to her. And she bursts forth into psalmic material. You gotta be a, a serious yod -Heh vav -Heh loving a woman who knows the scriptures inside out and is always ruminating on them day and night, like Psalm 1-1 says. You gotta be that kind of person, that kind of woman, for you to have this visitation and burst forth in this declaration. Then Miriam said, my nefesh magnifies yod heh vav -Hey. She names him. And my spirit greatly rejoices in God, my savior, rescuer, deliverer. For he has looked with care upon the humble state of his doule, the feminine word for slave, used like of persons like David, Abraham. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Yeah, she is blessed indeed. For the mighty one has done a great thing for me, and holy is his name. Holy is his name. She sounds Levitical now. And his mercy is from generation to generation to the ones who fear or revere him. He has displayed power with his arm. That's so Israelite. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. She's anti, you know, she's not a Babylonian. She's a New Jerusalem gal.
He has brought down rulers from thrones and exalted humble ones. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty handed. He has helped. She knows. Look at that. Helped his servant Israel. She knows God as the azer that we've been talking about, the helper. Perfectly suitable helper for a man is a woman. God is the perfectly suited helper for Israel. Azer is used of both. All women. And Yodei Vavhe. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. What a synthesis of the Tanakh in a poetic piece of psalmic song. She is definitely like Rahav. I'm going to go back. An exemplary woman of the Bible. Correcting the historical denigration of Mary Magdalene. I'm happy to say that a synagogue was discovered in Migdal. Uh, Migdal is the Hebrew for that place. And the Aramaic is uh, Magdala. So she is Miriam of Magdala. That's where Miriam Magdalene comes from. We do her justice by calling her by her real name, Miriam. And so she's Miriam of Migdal or Miriam of Magdala. Whoops. There you go. The scholarly consensus is that the interpretation that Miriam of Mag Magdala, that's the Aramaic, or of Migdal, that's the Hebrew, was a prostitute has its source in the conflation of the story of the woman sinner in Luke 7, 37 in following, among whom, I'm sorry, with the story of the women that Yeshua healed in Luke 8, 1 in following. Say that again. The source of the claim that Miriam of Migdal was a prostitute is a conflation of the story of the woman sinner in Luke 7, 37 and following with the story of the women that Yeshua healed in Luke 8, 1 and following, among whom Miriam of Migdal is named first and was said to be delivered from seven demons. Notice, Miriam's exemplary prominence in all four of the accounts of the good news, and note that she was the first eyewitness to the resurrection of Yeshua. And she must have had such a prominent place as the accounts of the good news lead us to believe, or all the legends that developed about her, including that she was married to Yeshua and they had children, would not have emerged. If she was not close to Yeshua and a major figure in the movement, then all these legends about her would not have developed. So notice where she is and the prominence of her in the four accounts of the good news. And then last for us to conclude our little section or our little session, uh, Lunch and Learn, on women, men and women, ethnicity, unity. What? Hopefully by now the what is clear how all of this fit together in a single unit. But how should we respond to 21st century ideas about men and women? Well, you know I'm gonna say we should speak the truth in love and notice the tone in which I say it. But uh, this is how I would conclude the matter and I'm in 100% concurrence with David Hillel Gelenter from his book, Judaism, A Way of Being. This is from pages 88 and 91, and I'm calling this Speaking the Truth in Love. We need to graciously reject the idea that women are in any way inferior. 
And this rejection, graciously, needs to be proven by the way we live, the way we speak, the way we think, the way we act, the way we behave. Number two, we need to graciously reject the deconsecration and collapse of marriage into the background noise as just one more arrangement among many. So we need to speak the truth in love. Marriage is the bringing together of one man and one woman. And we need to graciously continue to speak that truth in love and pay the price for what it costs us because the world has gone in a very different direction than God's established order. And finally, number three, we need to graciously reject the idea that male and female should become interchangeable and then melt together, thereby discharging the battery that operates civilization, wiring its two poles together and shorting out humanity. And again, listen to the tone of my voice and we need to speak the truth in love and we need to explain why and we need to be savvy about science and genetics and whose genetics may have been misfired and led to something that doesn't seem to be God's ordering of male and female. And we need to be careful how we respond to those situations. Again, we're not here to be a part of the US combative us versus them. There are only two options. Um, remember though that I'm going to put a caveat on that. It doesn't mean there aren't times where there are only two sides to an issue. Sometimes there are. That would be truth and lie, right and wrong. But then there might be shades of gray and other areas where we have to talk about, well, is that right in this circumstance? Is that wrong in this circumstance? We always need dialogue, not warlike debate. We can never reduce everything to two sides, but sometimes <clears throat> there are two sides to an issue. It's when, when that becomes the combative default stance for everything we know we're in trouble, that's called polarized partisanship. And polarized partisanship doesn't fit the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5. Go read the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5 and see how many of them are frictional, fractional, relational, problematic behaviors that show no signs of having and possessing the spirit of God. Be very careful. So my ultimate closing word has to do with speaking the truth in love on these three or four topics here. I will stop my share and open it up for any further dialogue before we close out at 1 p.m. Thanks a million for coming out today. Thank you so much, Henry, for that awesome, uh, just absolutely awesome and great, great information for us. Looks like you might have one question here. It was a, a it was a lot to absorb, but it was uh, some excellent teaching. So I appreciate it. I'm definitely going to get those books. This is Sharon. Yeah, Sharon, you'll have the slide decks. You have 100% of my content. Okay. You have the video to rehear it. And we're going to keep going. And then we'll have a big course on it um, later sometime, probably in 2022. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming today. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the men that came today because it, a lot of the onus is on men to correct perceptions you know and behavior look at the behavior of men you know one thing we didn't talk about that's in the course is besides dealing with the you know inferiority the perceived inferiority of women i deal with the treatment of women as objects it's a whole section of the course the objectification of women 
And men need to be responsible to be loudmouthed about it, to say that's not acceptable. And thank God in the 21st century, all that misbehavior and mistreatment of women in the form of sexual harassment is being exposed. You know, thank God that's all happening in our day. There's nothing that's unrighteous or unjust that will not be exposed before Messiah comes. Well, so we'll be thankful for that. You know, um, you were talking about how um, um, people um, uh, misinterpret um, the, the, the woman, uh, you know, Mary, Mary Magdalene. Yes. Um, you know, say that she was a prostitute, you know, because they confused her with the, the sinner in that other story. Well, um, another woman in the Bible that's, that's misunderstood, I think is misunderstood, is the woman in John chapter four, when Yeshua was at the well. You know, it says that she had five husbands and the man that she's with now is not her husband. We don't know why she had five husbands. The only thing that we know is that she's now with a man that she's, that's not her husband. Um, but if you remember, Tamar had two husbands and she lost both of them, you know, because they died. Um, and then she was with a man who was not her husband. He was her father-in-law. But she ended up in the genealogy of Yeshua. Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, that the, 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 the uh, interpretation of the woman in John 4 is, is wrong. You know, it's not, it's not justified by anything we read in scripture. Um, I, I also, um, also, if you read on later in that chapter, she went back into the city and she told those guys, the, the men of the city, to come out with her. They would not have followed her. If she had a reputation as a tramp, they would have thought, oh, that's just another one of her boyfriends. We're not going to go out and see it. But, but yeah, so I think that the reputation that she has, that, that people give her, is not justified by anything you read in scripture. Oh, uh, this is a very good contribution to this um you know, lunch and learn, because I can tell you that at the beginning of many of the books that have been written of late on women in the Bible uh, begin with a discussion of all the kind of assumptions that are brought to stories, because mm -hmm. I could I could easily say uh, another story that's in the course that's just like the one Al just shared, because we do mention that in the course is the story of Bathsheba, David and Bathsheba. Somehow it's presumed that Bathsheba did something wrong where she was bathing that caused David to do what he did, as if David wasn't the, the one responsible for what took place. And there's nothing in the text that gives us any inclination that Bathsheba did something wrong. For all we know, she was in a ritual bath in the proper place. And it's David's eyes that are the problem. So there's this assumption that somehow Bathsheba did something wrong as well. And again, Al saying the right thing. Where do we get our information? From the text or from preconceptions that have been handed down in history? Very, very important. Very good, Al. Well, I think we might, I don't, you know, I don't know, um, but I think we might be able to make that, you know, say the same thing about the woman in John chapter eight, the, the one, the woman who was caught in adultery. They say that they caught her in the very act. If they caught her in the very act, why didn't they bring the man? It's possible that they just picked some woman off the street. This is this is not something that, that you have to read around in the scripture, but it's possible they picked some woman off the street and, and tried to trick Yeshua. But yeah, that passage it, in biblical scholarship is called a crux interpretum because of all kinds of issues associated with it. So that warrants its own um, that warrants its own a one hour lunch and learn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I imagine it would, you know, because that is that is very uh, very confusing. But um, 
<laughs> it's 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 possible that that's another one that's been misinterpreted. Um, I don't know. Henry, uh, Dr. Judith, uh, can Judith unmute yourself? Shalom, yeah. everyone. Shalom, Shalom, Dr. Judy. Yes, I'm sorry, I've been struggling with my with network issues, but I, I just wanted to ask a quick, a quick question. Who is this woman, the woman of virtue that is uh, in the book of Proverbs? Is it, is it a particular woman? In no, that, or, or what? no it, it's clear by the way it's written that it's a paradigm. It's the ideal woman. And um, as you work through it, because I, I recommend you all do it, I got to tell you something that is true. So um, on August 5th, I'll be married 44 years to Marguerite, my wife. And I worked through the text of Proverbs 31 early this morning again, uh, after years. And I can't believe how many of the aspects that I see there, I will write to my wife in one of the anniversary cards on the 44th. So it's a paradigm of the ideal woman, um, you know, who is a lover of God and later a lover of Messiah. And, um, that's all it is. It's it's the comprehensive holistic pattern for a eshet. It's a eshet, sorry, chayil, a woman of valor. And I listed the characteristics there in English after looking at the Hebrew again. So it's really a pattern, a paradigm, a model for us to, you know, for a woman to dive into. That's a great so question. So I can, I can take myself and put myself in that, uh, to be that woman, if I, if I want to be a, a role model, if I want to be that woman. Yes. Well, Great. you can follow in her footsteps. Well, you know, um, I heard, uh, I read, actually read another commentary once that said, that doesn't actually refer to a particular woman, uh, I mean, that refers, I mean, it does, but it also, it refers to the bride of Messiah or the bride of the bride of um, God's bride. Um, and that we should all be striving towards that male or female. Well, that is a one hour lunch and learn too. Mm. We can't because take up any, we're, we're already past our finish time, so I can't take up a new topic and do it justice. <laughs> and you know, as a biblical scholar, I will not spend 10 seconds on something that fast. Right. <laughs> but, that's, um, but that's very good, because as I looked at it, I thought, wow, I have a lot to learn there. You know, one other interesting thing to uh, Al's point in mentioning the different women in the Bible, we notice, I've noticed that uh, Yeshua or God never condemns, even how we misconstrued their behavior. There's nothing that were, they were condemned once they were addressed or, or you know, their situations mm -hmm. brought up. And that always stood out to me. And then the other point is in that Proverbs 31, that woman is not just some little meek woman following along behind her um, husband, but she's very strong, industrious. She's like a Kail. I mean, she's like a great, strong woman. Hey, when you look at the semantic range of the word Kail in Hebrew, one of the meanings is army. Yeah, it's amazing. She's a soldier. She soldiers on, yeah. women soldier on. Yes. Yeah, very, very good. All right, everybody. Well, it's 105. We started at 1205. And uh, that's all she wrote for today's Lunch and Learn. I'm, I'm indebted that y'all came out, men and women. And I hope that we are those in the 21st century that just make a difference out there in bringing a wholeness, a unity, um, and, you know, 
not some sappy superficial love, but the true love of God that manifests itself in loving the one next to you as if they were the same as you. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. All right. All right. Thanks. Have a toad. See, See ya. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Henry.